Ladies and gentlemen, it's the comedians! Thank you very much, boys. You work very hard. Thank you. One, two, one, two. Testing, testing. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Wheel Tappers Working Men's when we have a grand array of turns for our members tonight. <laughs> Topping Bill, we've got Manchester's own Sammy Davis Jr. Bert Parkinson. <laughs> that's not his real name, that's just his stage name. <laughs> Comes here every week for 30 bob and I know very well he can't afford to pay us. <laughs> one, two, one, two, one, two. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, we've had complaints from Thartis as comes here to entertain our members. <laughs> that the acoustics are bad in this club, now we've put poison down and set traps. <laughs> Now, we've got these acoustics. <laughs> We're having no acoustics in this club while I'm chairman here and that's straight. <laughs> By the way, pies have come. <laughs> and they've come on their own, so put plenty of pepper on. <laughs> one, two, one, two. <laughs> Next week's artist, a nail to the door. <laughs> Now, we've had one or two uh, suggestions from our members <laughs> that we get a chandelier. Now, there's no one who's complained. <laughs> so we won't be mithering. <laughs> now, as you know, ladies and gentlemen, Tommy Taylor died a Tuesday. Member here for 44 years, Tommy. We'll have two minutes silence and then we'll get on with the bingo. <laughs> daft, aren't they? Daft. The fellow went to the doctor said, Doctor, he said, I'm awful feeling, he says. I feel like a pair of curtains. The doctor says, get on and pull yourself together. <laughs> but the Liverpool people, you see, we, we can't understand sophisticated jokes. We can't get them. We like daft ones, ones that we know. <laughs> ones we can get. Like the Liverpool fella, he went into a psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist said, what is it? And he went... <laughs> it's our kid. He thinks he's an orange. <laughs> and the psychiatrist said, well, get him down here. He said, I've got a mirror in my pocket. <laughs> and the other Liverpool fella went into a cobbler's. He went into a cobbler's with a pair of boots. He said, I want these sold. He came back the next day, the cobbler gave me a dollar, and he said, I've sold them. <laughs> And there was another Liverpool fella. <laughs> These jokes are full of Liverpool fellas, eh? <laughs> he went into a, a photographer's. <laughs> I got that out. <laughs> went into a photographer's with a photograph of his dad. He said, I want this photograph of my dad reproducing. But I want you to do him without the bowler hat. <laughs> See, his dad had a bowler hat on. And the photographer, being very obliging, 
He went, yes, sir, certainly, sir, yes, sir. I think we can manage that, sir. And just as he was going out, he said, oh, by the way, sir, what way did your father have his hair parted? He said, well, you know that when you take the bowl of that off. <laughs> There was one old chap, he must have been 107, he was in the doctor's one day, he said, Doctor, Doctor, I want you to give me a medical examination. He said, what for? He said, I want to marry a young girl of 16. He said, at your age, it could prove fatal. Well, if she dies, she dies. <laughs> and where I live, we don't bury him like you do in Manchester. Don't dig these big holes and fill him in afterwards. Where I live, they take him to the top of the mountain. There was a hearse going up the mountain and the back doors fell open. The coffin slid out down the mountain into the main street, into a chemist shop. Hit the counter, the cops come out and he said, have you got anything to stop this coffin? leaving the lunatic asylum, fella leaving the lunatic asylum and the head lad sent for him, he said, well, you're leaving us after 20 years. He said, you've been in here 20 years now, what do you want to be? He said, well, he said, uh, I could be anything. He said, I've served my time here as a joiner. He said, I could, I could be a joiner. He said, I served five years as a plumber. He said, I could be a plumber. He said, and I went in for uh, nursing. He said, I could be a nurse. He said, and then I can, he said, I could stop here and be what I've always been. He said, what's that? He says, a teapot. <laughs> Fellow went into his shop, he said, packet of cigarettes. Girl said, yes, sir, plain or filter? He said, filter. She said, cork or mental? He said, cork. She said, king size or ordinary? He said, ordinary. She said, Virginia or Turkish blend? He said, Virginia. She said, flip top or crush proof pack? <laughs> she said, forget it, I've chucked it up. <laughs> Dr. Watson said to Sherlock Holmes, you'll never guess what happened to me today, Sherlock. He said, I know exactly what happened to you. He said, he got up this morning, had cornflakes and coffee, went down, seen a, a film at the Odeon, went in a club in Soho, had your tea in town, came home, read a book, went straight to bed. He said, marvellous, how do you know that, Sherlock? He said, I was with you, you Burke. <laughs> Fellow went to the dentist. The dentist said, that's a big cavity, a big cavity. He said, don't repeat yourself. I didn't, it was an echo. <laughs> Little kid said, mommy, mommy, how do buffaloes make love? She said, I don't know, son, your father's a mason. <laughs> to the doctor's, he had a touch of laryngitis. That's when he can't speak. One fellow went in the restaurant. Milk bar. He said, can you, what milkshakes have you got? The girl said, raspberry and vanilla. He said, have you got laryngitis? Only raspberry. <laughs> <laughs> the Jack and Ori joke. <laughs> no, this fellow had laryngitis, knocked on the doctor's door. The nurse came out, he said, excuse me. Rude, aren't we? Rude. Sell some more Jack and Nori jokes. <coughs> Fellow was playing cricket, he's getting stripped off, and he had a roll on him. <laughs> Miss, how long have you been wearing a roll on? He said, ever since the wife found it in the back of the car. <laughs> <laughs> you know what they're like in Liverpool for football? Fanatics. So this Everton supporter is walking up Scotland Road, and he takes this dreadful pain in the stomach, and he dashes into the doctor's, and there's two doors. I said, male patients, female patients. So he walks into the one marked, male patients, and there's two more doors. And I said, panel patients, ped patients. Well, he's not on the panel, so he's under the one marked, ped patients, and there's two more doors. Everton supporters, Liverpool supporters. <laughs> and he walks into the one marked, Everton supporters, and found himself out in a Scottish road again. <laughs> So the way 
they'd tell them, wouldn't they? <laughs> but even the kids in Liverpool are funny. The kids. That's where the humour stems from, children and old folk. My little fellow, he came in the other day, he said, Hey, Dad, Dad. I said, What is it, lad? He said, That teacher. I'm sure she fancies me. <laughs> I said, The teacher fancies you. How do you make that out? He said, Well, she keeps putting kisses next to me sums. <laughs> and there was a fellow down now, the other week, he turned out to his lad, he said, Lad. There's a knock at the door, go and see who it is. So his lad went to the door and he come back, he said, Dad, there's a man at the door with a baldy head. He said, go and tell him I've got one. <laughs> and my little fella came in the other day again, he said, Hey, Dad, Dad, that teacher murdered me. I said, the teacher murdered you, what for, son? He said, but I haven't spelling. She so turned out and said, can anyone spell pistol down? And I went, T-H-I-S-T-L-A-D-O-W-N. She said, very good, now what does it mean? And he said, it means raining very heavy, miss. <laughs> Mr. Flanagan, yes. He says, this is the general foreman here on the building site. The shovels haven't arrived. What'll I do? He said, well, tell the lads to lean on each other till they come. <laughs> <laughs> I love this one. We hear this one. This, oh, this, this is a crack of this one. But it's the way I tell it, we hear <laughs> This young Indian, he goes to Las Vegas and he's got no money. So he sends up a smoke signal to his father in West Dakota. Smoke, smoke, puff, puff. Sent me, double puff, smoky smoke, puff, puff, smoke, <laughs> some money. Gets no answer. So he sends up another signal. Double smoke, puff, 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 double smoke. Smoky puff. As quick as you can, send me, puff, puff, double smoke, some money. Nothing. Just a dad. There's a big atomic explosion behind them. And this big mushroom of smoke goes up and his father sends back a message. Puff, puff, double, double, smoke, smoke. What the hell are you shouting for? <laughs> the Pony Express. Riding with the mail. Through Apache territory. To Fort Apache. And he's riding there. He's got a lance right through his neck. <laughs> Six arrows in his back. <laughs> They shot the arse from under him. <laughs> shot in the leg and he hobbled to the fort. He kicked open the colonel's door and he said, there's no mail today. <laughs> Fellow picked the phone up, he says, hello, is that the asylum? And the voice at the other end said, no, it can't be, we're not on the phone. <laughs> I walked into a psychiatrist. He says, I can't stop telling lies. He says, I don't believe you. <laughs> fellow walked into the barber shop. He said, a many's in front of me. The fellow says, nine. He said, he'll come back in the morning. Come back the next morning. He said, a many's in front of me. The barber said, six. He said, he'll come back in the morning. He went in again. He said, the next one. Many's in front of me. He said, seven. He said, he'll come back in the morning. The barber said to the wee apprentice barber, go and see where that fellow goes. So the wee fellow went out and came back an hour later. He said, where do you go? He said, your house. <laughs> It's true about him having 26 children, you know, you read in the paper not long back about this woman in Australia giving birth to nine children. Well, Di's wife got the record, she gave birth to ten. And he was so excited, he was in a pub and he was drinking double gin and tonics all night. And he phones a matron up and he says, any news? She said, yes, you've got twins, but there's a lot more to come. <laughs> he had five double gin and tonics, he's back on the phone, he says, hey, and, and, any more news? She said, yes, you've got quads, but phone back a little later on. Another five double gin and tonics. She said, hey, any, any more news? She said, yes, you've got six, but this must be a record. A bottle of gin later, he was so drunk, he phoned the Glamorgan cricket ground by mistake. 
He said, what's the score now? And I said, they're all out, and the last one's a duck. <laughs> Irishman, the Scotsman, and the Englishman caught by the cannibals. The cannibal chief said to the Scotsman... Well, there's always an Irishman with an Englishman and a Scotsman. <laughs> the Welsh can never get in there. <laughs> he says... He says to the Scotsman, where do you come from? He says, Glasgow. He said, stick him in the pot. He said to the second fellow, where do you come from? He said, I come from London. He said, stick him in the pot. He says to the Irishman, where do you come from? He said, Dublin. He said, let him go. So the cannibal says to the chief, why are you going to let? He's an Irish cannibal as well. <laughs> he says, why are you going to let that fellow go? He said, well, the last fellow I had from Dublin in the pot, he ate all the bloody potatoes. <laughs> And I saw this fellow with a long face, and I talked to anybody, me, that I talk back, and I said, I, I said, um, what's up with you? And he said, I'm not going home to our house. I said, aren't you? He said, no. I said, why aren't you going back? He said, there's a terrible smell in our house. <laughs> I said, is there? <laughs> He said, aye, the wife keeps cats. I said, well, have you tried opening the window? He said, what, and let all my pigeons out? <laughs> hey, and what about, what about this horse that collapsed in Piccadilly? And this policeman was stood there with his notebook ten minutes. And the sergeant said, well, what are you waiting for? He said, how do you spell Piccadilly? <laughs> He said, um, P I K O. Drag it into Tib Street. <laughs> <laughs> Drag it into Tib Street. <laughs> <laughs> we'll all have belly ache, won't we? <laughs> hey, and what about the. and, and this. This, vi this village idiot joined the army. It wasn't me, but I knew him. And, uh, he joined up and, um, and he lost his rifle. And the CO said, where is it? He said, I've lost it. <laughs> he said, you'll have to pay for it now. He said, I'm not paying for it because it's not mine. He said, you'll have to. He said, because anything you get issued within the army, if you lose it, you have to pay for it. He said, well, what would happen if I was driving a tank? And I lost that. <laughs> He said, you'd have to pay for it. He said, it's no wonder these captains go down with the ships, is it? <laughs> Kelly and Flanagan went into the circus. And there was all these table tennis balls on the jets of water. So he lifted up the rifle. He said, watch this. Six of them. All the balls went down. He said, fantastic, Kelly, fantastic. But watch this. And he lifted the rifle. Bang! One shot and the whole lot went down. He says, how'd you do that? He said, I shot the fella pumping the water. <laughs> <laughs> Two lunatics talking to the asylum once said, what was you before you come in here? He said, I kept bees. He said, how do you make it pay? He said, well, I let them go in the park. Six o'clock every morning, they go in the park, collect all the pollen, and I sell the honey. You said you're telling lies. You said the park doesn't open one nine o'clock. <laughs> he said, I know, but I know where there's all in the fence. I got my first fan letter today. <laughs> Do you get it? I got it. I got a letter from my mum as well. She, she writes to me now and again. I'll just read it to you. My granny sent me one once, you know, but this one's from my mum. It says, Dear Ken. She's not Scotch, cos they say that as well, don't they, Dear Ken? <laughs> Do you get it? <laughs> Dear Ken. <laughs> my mum says that as well. Dear Ken. Here are a few lines. Then she's written two straight lines underneath there. <laughs> Here are a few lines with the family news. Um, you will be pleased to learn that your father now has a new job. 
with 500 men under him. He is cutting the grass at the cemetery. <laughs> Did you get it? Eh? <laughs> uh, and your brother John has joined the army, and he has only been in a fortnight, and they have made him a court martial already. <laughs> And he is going away for six months to give Her Majesty pleasure. <laughs> That's all right. And it goes on to say here, um, your father now has started keeping pigs in the backyard and there is an awful smell from your loving mother. <laughs> <laughs> Farmer had a big shout. He said, I'm going to sell it. He said, don't sell it. Bring it over to my place and we'll put it with the boar. He said, I've got a big boar and we'll stick them together and we'll make a few bob. He said, right. So he stuck the great big sow in the wheelbarrow and took it over to his mate's farm and he put it with the boar. He said, now, how do we know whether it's all right or not? He said, well, in the morning, when you look out the window, if the sow is rolling in the mud, it's OK. It's pregnant. But if it's eating the grass, you'll have to bring it back. This morning, he opens the window, there's the sow eating the grass, in the wheelbarrow, to his mate, to the boar. <laughs> not getting bored, are you? So they put it with the boar again. Next morning, woke up there, it was eating the grass again. So he had to put it back in the wheelbarrow. Push it all the way up to his mate's place. Next morning, eating the grass. Off a Wednesday in the wheelbarrow. This went on all week. Saturday morning, he's having a lay and he said to his wife, Mary, for God's sake, look outside and see what the sow is doing. Whether it's rolling in the mud or eating the grass. She said, it's sitting in the wheelbarrow. <laughs> Two old ladies lived in Morecambe once, and they, they'd never been out with a fella. They were frightened, the fellas, these two ladies. And they, oh, they really locked themselves in the house. They had the groceries pushed through the letterbox and everything. <laughs> and they had a little cat called Minnie, and they wouldn't let the cat go out in case a Tom got it. They, had, they hated all the male sex, animals or anything, you see. They didn't like them. And one day, the milkman got his foot inside the door, because the milk bottle wouldn't go through the letterbox. <laughs> and... It, <laughs> It finishes up, it finishes up, he's marrying one of these ladies. And the other one's scared to death, she says, I'm worried for you. Going off with a man like that, you must send me a telegram first thing in the morning, let me know you're all right. Telegram arrived, it said, let Minnie out. <laughs> <laughs> this skinhead was talking to his mate, see? So he said, uh, you like me car? His mate said, yeah. He says, sir, terrific, that, terrific, like that, terrific, like it, you're terrific, that, not terrific. He says, you got a flat tyre? Yeah, he said, oh, haven't I? He said, how do you get that? He said, I'll run over a bottle. 
He said, didn't you see it? He said, no, it was in this geezer's pocket. <laughs> We're all right, that one, eh? Oh, I'll, hey, hey. Do you know what happened at our local church? Hey, Vika got up Sunday morning. This is true, missus. This is true. Vika got up, and he, you know how you do with sermon? After sermon, he said, well, ladies and gentlemen, he said, I've got some sad news for you. He said, I'm very sorry to tell you that Mr. Greenhill has absconded with the savings. He says, we're skinned. He says, so we'll all join together in M337. There is a green hill far away. <laughs> oh, I two fellas, they are two mad, two mad scientists talking together. <coughs> Excuse me. And one says, what are you doing? Mate? He said, I've just invented a submarine without any motors. He said, gee, that's good. That's marvellous, that. How's it going to the water? He said, well, there's a tap inside. <laughs> and I flood the submarine. He said, yeah, that's clever, that. How's it come up? He said, I pull the plug out. <laughs> Fella going on the motorway, new Rolls Royce, one of the pools, new Rolls Royce. One double, 30 mile an hour. That's all it does, 30 mile an hour. So he got on the hard shoulder, rang up the AA. He said, excuse me, he said, I bought a new Rolls Royce. He said, it won't go above 30 miles an hour. The AA man said, what gear we're in? He said, me uh, donkey jacket and me welly. I love all them daffs. Because we get, we get about quite a lot. You know, I walked in this hotel, nice five-star hotel it was. You could see three of them through a hole in the roof. <laughs> <laughs> and it's all posh and all sat there picking the nose with a knife and fork. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I got chatting to this girl and we went, to, you know, went out after us. Oh, she was common. <laughs> ooh and rough, ooh. All night, four-letter words, all night. Don't, can't, won't, shall. <laughs> <laughs> I must tell you about our next door neighbour. I'm not telling you which side in case he's watching the programme. But I've got... <laughs> he's mean, he's mean. He's one of them fellas who, if he's playing dominoes in a pub, he won't knock in case the waiter comes. You, know? <laughs> you can always tell when they're expecting company because they've got a fork in the sugar bowl. <laughs> He's the only fella I know that can light a cigarette in his pocket. <laughs> <laughs> he had to charter a plane, a private plane, to go to London for him and his wife because there were no regular services and he had to get there at this particular time. And he begrudged paying all this money for this private aeroplane. He said to the pilot, he says, you are making a lot of money out of us. He said, charging all this just to fly us down to London. And he went on and on, and the pilot was fed up even before they took off. He said, look, I'll tell you one thing. He said, you and your wife sit in the back. He said, and if you're quiet all the way and never speak all the way to London, I'll fly you there for nothing. He said, but if you open your mouth once, it'll cost you double. Is it a deal? And the fella said, yes, it is, you see. So he's in the back there, and the pilot starts. He was looping the loop and whizzing it down and cutting the engine off and flying between chimneys and... Doing everything, the fella never said a word. He got to London, the pilot said, well, I hold my hands up. I didn't think anybody could go through that without speaking. The fella said, you nearly got me once, he said. I nearly spoke. The pilot said, when was that? He said, when the wife fell out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here's a good one. I like this one. A man of 80 wanted to marry a girl of 17. He said to the doctor, I want a son and an heir before I die. And I want to marry a girl of 17. What do you suggest? The doctor said, get a lodger. <laughs> Six months later, he come back. He said, doctor, the wife's pregnant. He said, oh, good. You got a lodger? He said, yes. And she's pregnant as well. <laughs> the house was on fire in Spain. And on top of the house, there was this little Spaniard and the Spanish fire brigade came out and said, come on, jump into the blanket, we'll catch you. He said, no, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. They said, come on, jump. 
as he came flying through the air, they went, Hole! <laughs> this fellow was walking through the jungle. All of a sudden, he heard this trumpeting. <laughs> and there was this elephant lying on the floor with a huge thorn in its foot. And the fellow went, Wah! pulled it out. And the elephant put his trunk round his neck like that, a little cuddle. Five years later, he's at the zoo with the kids, Bellevue. And he goes into the circus, and all of a sudden, six elephants come out, nose to tail. And the last one stopped, looked at him, walked straight over, put his trunk round his neck, and killed him. It wasn't the same elephant. <laughs> Do you know there were two little lads played, they were playing marbles at side at road. They used to play marbles, used to play marbles. Yeah. Philippine, you're Philippine. And the Philippine that sided up with these marbles, and all of a sudden the big Rolls Royce draws up. And this bloke got out, and he went across to this house, and he knocked on the door, and a smashing bit of crackling knocked on the door. <laughs> oh, she was a belter. <laughs> he said, Good afternoon, my love. Mr. Smith sent me. She said, Oh, come along in. And, and he went in. Do you know that in 20 minutes? <laughs> and this two little lads are watching, you know. And the door opened and he came back out to get a five pound. He said, thank you very much. See you again. She said, tell our love. <laughs> Ten minutes later, another big car rolls up. Another bloke gets out, knocks on the door. Good afternoon, my love. Mr. Smith sent me. Oh, he says, come on in. And he went in. And he were in 20 minutes. <laughs> Little Tommy and his mates watching the door, you know, they're watching. <laughs> 20 minutes later, he's out. He says, thank you very much, love. Enjoyed that. Lovely. She says, fair enough. Call again. So Tommy looked at his mate. He said, has there any money? He said, I've got tuppence. <laughs> he says, well, I've fought them. That's a tanner. We're in here. <laughs> See, I'm going back a year or two. You can tell, can't you? <laughs> so they went over, knocked on the door. And this lovely bird says, yes. He says, Mr. Smith sent us. <laughs> oh, she says, come on in. In the went, you know. Ah, <laughs> the troop tin, two little troopers that were in. She says, where's your money? A tanner. She took tanner, and don't she did? She lashed him up and down that passageway. She knocked him up passage, danced all over. Upstairs, down, passage back, up in front door and kicked him straight out into the street. Little Tommy got up first, he dusted his hand down, he said, bye, good model, love. I'm glad I ain't got a fiver. I couldn't have stuck 20 <laughs> minutes of that. <laughs> was coming down this morning, I knew she was coming because the dog was in the corner biting its nails. <laughs> I thought, I'll have a laugh, you see. So I took the knocker, this is true, I took the knocker off the door and I put a sponge knocker back on. <laughs> and I hid behind the curtain. And she came along, she got this sponge knocker and she went. <laughs> so I opened the door and said, <laughs> I took her down the art gallery and we walked around. She said, I suppose this is one of the monstrosities you call modern art. I said, no, mother, it's a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. There's an Irish fellow said, the Dublin boat come in, you see, and his Irish fellow said, look at the size of that ship. Oh, Jesus, look at the size of that ship. I've never seen a ship like that. It's a big ship. Never seen a big ship like that. Never seen a big ship like that. But I said, what about Queen Elizabeth? He said, I bet you she hasn't either. <laughs> a fellow went for a job as a coal miner, and it was on one of these little pits in the village miles from anywhere that the coal board knew nothing about. They'd forgotten all about it. But it was still there, and he got this job, and he said, I want my pit helmet with the light on it. He said, oh, we don't have that. We're only a little pit. We're not modernised yet. He said, you just put your cap on, and you have a flash lamp. <laughs> so he says, oh, all right, that'll do. He said, where's my pick? He said, oh, we don't have picks. We're not that modernised here yet. He says, knife and fork. <laughs> so he got his knife and fork, and he said, where's the lift for going down? He said, oh, we don't have a lift. He said, you just slide down the rope. We're not modernised yet. 
So he got his knife and fork and his cap and his torch and he slid down the rope and he crawled under to the coal face and all the other fellas are there working and he saw a bat flying about and he got his fork and he pinned this bat to the wall and the foreman said, everybody out on strike. <laughs> he sabotaged the cooling system. <laughs> a fisherman story, two fishermen talking, two fishermen talking. One said, I caught a fish the other day. 28 stone, 30 feet long. Oh, he says, you're going on a bit there, he said, aren't you? 28 stone, 30 feet long. I don't believe you. He said, but yesterday, he said, I caught a fish. 24 stone, 70 foot long. Cut it open. There's a ship's lantern inside from 1483, and the candle was still lit. <laughs> He says, you what? He said, no, you are bobbing out of it. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do. You cut 20 feet off the fish, I'll blow the candle out. <laughs> a load of bloody rubbish that was, wasn't it? <laughs> Must tell you this one, a young solicitor, a young solicitor, <clears throat> just started in business, you see, and he hadn't got any clients. So a knock comes on the door. He lifts the phone up quick, pretend there was somebody on the phone. Hello, come in. Wilson versus Jones, yes, of course. Sit down, sir. Fellow, sit down. Yes, Wilson versus yes, seventy-five thousand pounds. Of course we will. We get damages dead easy. We might make it eighty thousand out of court. Certainly we will. No, not to worry. Thank you very much. Bye bye. And he said to the gentleman, sat down. Yes, what can I do for you, sir? The gentleman said, I'm from the GPO. I've come to connect the phone up. <laughs> I went to the doctor's last week, he said, stick your tongue out and walk over the window. <laughs> I said, would that help? He said, no, I can't stand that geezer across the road. <laughs> I don't know, I'm bloody laughing at me. Two Irish fellas laying, laying paving stones there. They stood there in the wellies laying these paving stones. Flags, you know. And a big Rolls Royce pulls up, and the fella in the Rolls Royce sat there for hours, watching these two Irish fellas putting the flags down. Mick said, who the hell is he, Pat? Go and have a word. He said, I will, yeah. I will, yes. I will. <laughs> he said, excuse me, sir, do you want something? And the fella in the Rolls Royce said, no, no, I'm just watching your chappies lay the flags. So Mick said, are you in the same line of business? He said, no, I'm a scientist, but I work just as hard as you chaps. He said, I work to a millionth of an inch. Mix it all, it's no good to us. Them flags have got to be spot on. <laughs> I was working this Catholic club last night in Wigan. I could tell it was a Catholic club because they called the bingo numbers out in Latin so that the Protestants couldn't win. And, <laughs> well, <laughs> and while I was in, there's a wonderful act on. Oh, it was a, it was a Chorley Flaggers mate's assistant. And he came on with a tin hat on and polythene underpants. <laughs> and he juggled with two ton of loose soot. It was very good. <laughs> <laughs> I can kick you ones, don't you? <laughs> Tic Tac fella died and all of the, all of the blokes are at the Tic Tac's funeral. Not these Tic Tac fellas who flagged the prices over to one another, you know, on the race courses. There they were all round the poor fella's grave and they lowered him down. One says to you, Harry, what's his chances of getting to heaven? He says, six to four. <laughs> Then, no, two to one. I said, no, six to four. All of a sudden, the vicar come along with, you said to give him 33 to one, yeah? <laughs> 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 yeah could you laugh a wee bit quicker? Because I have to wait a <laughs> Thank you. And uh, the Pope has made a fortune out of his new book, The Pills Grim Program. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. Very good. They've just invented a new pill for Catholics where it's three and a half ton. You put it up against the door and your husband can't get in. <laughs> I Maggie Murphy went to the doctor. She said, I've forgotten to take my contradictive pills. <laughs> he says, you're ignorant. She says, yeah, three months. <laughs> yeah. 
on me a lot. And I couldn't come dashing on tonight because I went to a party last night and had too much ale. It was a special occasion. It was my granddad's 103rd birthday party. He wasn't there. He died when he was 29. <laughs> That's a lot of him. <laughs> I always feel sorry for people who don't drink me. If you know anybody who doesn't drink, feel sorry for them because when they wake up in the morning, that's the best they're going to feel all day. <laughs> Those boozers improve as the day goes on. Looking forward to summer, getting away from it all for a while. I was in Morecambe a couple of years ago. 14 weeks in Morecambe. Somebody has to go there. <laughs> I lost the raffle. <laughs> they put all the artists' names in a hat and Mr Delphont pulls them out and the ones who lose have to go to Morecambe. <laughs> it's a sort of cemetery with lights, isn't it? <laughs> Mad Gay City. <laughs> Stockport with C. <laughs> If you want any excitement in Morecambe, they all go in the grocers and watch the bacon slicer. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely girl she is. <laughs> Wednesday's the big day, they all turn out and watch the traffic lights change. <laughs> Half past ten it is if you don't want to miss it. <laughs> Doesn't last long. What a place. They don't bury the dead, they stand them up in bus shelters. <laughs> with a bingo ticket in there. <laughs> yeah. Settle down now. Oh. I don't want you to make a noise because I've got edit. <laughs> Just putting some toilet water on me air and the seat fell down. <laughs> it's good that, isn't it? Uh, I made that one up. <laughs> I said to this fellow, why is your dog wearing brown boots? He said it's black ones are being mended. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're having a good time, aren't we? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I saw this fella pulling a piece of string. I, I talked to anybody, me. You know. <laughs> I said, what are you pulling that for? He said, you want to try pushing here? <laughs> <laughs> Do you get it, eh? He <laughs> <laughs> had a dog on the end. <sighs> I said, where are you checking the dog? He said, I'm going to have it put down. I said, is it mad? He said, well, it's not very pleased. <laughs> And this fella came up, he said, that dog bit my mother-in-law. He said, well, don't come to me for damages. He said, I want to buy it off you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to buy it off you. <laughs> he don't like his mother-in-law. <laughs> he gets up an hour earlier to wait a bit longer. <laughs> She don't like me. She says she's gonna dance on my grave, but I don't care because I'm getting buried at sea. <laughs> Fellow walked in a boot and shoe repair. He said, I've come for my boots. He said, When do you leave me? He says, 1933, Wednesday afternoon, September the 15th. He said, You what? He said, September 1933, the 15th, Wednesday afternoon. He said, this shop's changed hands 15 times since then. 
Yes, we'll have to have them. I'm starting work in the morning. <laughs> he said, have you got the ticket? He said, aye. Gives him a nice, clean ticket. He says, oh, it's ridiculous, this, is it? Goes down the cellar, comes back full of the... Well, black as the ace of spades. He said, I've got them. <laughs> Ready Thursday. <laughs> Magician working the big liners, doing all his tricks, and the parrot on the side there keeps saying, it's up his sleeve, it's down his jumper, it's up his trousers leg. Queers the, queers the act. And the ship's boiler's blue. <laughs> and him and the parrot's on this plank for four days. And the parrot's looking at him like that. And after four days, the parrot said, OK, I give up. What have you done with the ship? <laughs> Fellow walks in a hairdresser says, give us a Tony Curtis. Cut all his hair off, just like an egg. He says, you Burke. Do you know who Tony Curtis is? He said, well, I should do. I saw the king and I 14 times. We get worse, don't we? <laughs> You're enjoying yourself tonight, pet, aren't you? Where are you from, chicken? Where are you from, darling? Stockport. Stockport. Scruffy place, then. <laughs> Cheshire. Oh, bit, bit of class here at Cheshire. <laughs> A load of rubbish, that is, in Cheshire. There used to be a story used to go around, and I always remember, I had a different way, but the way I tell it was about the uh, train going through a tunnel. And in this train compartment was an old lady, a young girl, a United supporter and a City supporter. And as they're going through the tunnel, they yeah, smack. And as they come out the tunnel, there was the City supporter with a black eye and a bloody nose. <laughs> and the old girl thought to herself, isn't that, that young girl brave? Letting that City supporter kiss her and she smacking him in the mouth. <laughs> and the young girl thought, that's strange. City supporter, kissing the old woman, instead of kissing me. <laughs> and the city supporter thought, that United supporter's a lucky lad. He kisses the girl, and she thumps me. <laughs> <laughs> and the United supporter, an I a clever little lad. He kissed the back of my hand, slept a city supporter in the gob, and nobody says a bloody word. <laughs> And he, said, he went to the dentist, got set in chair. Dentist says, How many? He says, The lot, get them out, flower. <laughs> he says, Oh, lot. He said, Whip them out. <laughs> he said, It'll cost you 12 guineas. Oh, he said, Hold on, cock. Hold on. He said, Here's a dollar, slacken them. <laughs> <laughs>